To gain power over death, there must be self-denial and governance. Such is the excellent way, though it be the Via Dolorosa. He only can follow it who accounts the resurrection worth the passion, the kingdom worth the obedience, the power worth the suffering. And he and only he does not hesitate whose time has come. The last of the twelve labors of Heracles is the conquest of the three-headed dog Cerberus. For by this is denoted the final victory over the body with its three true senses. When this is accomplished, the process of ordeal is no longer necessary. The initiate is under a vow. The hierarch is free. He has undergone all his ordeals and has freed his will. For the object of the trial and the vow is polarization. When the fixed is volatilized, the Magian is free. Before this, he is, quote, subject. The man who seeks to be a hierarch must not dwell in cities. He may begin his initiation in a city, but he cannot complete it there. For he must not breathe dead and burnt air, air that is, the vitality of which is quenched. He must be a wanderer, a dweller in the plain and the garden and the mountains. He must commune with the starry heavens and maintain direct contact with the great electric currents of living air and with the unpaved grass and earth of the planet. Going barefoot and oft bathing his feet, it is in unfrequented places, in lands such as are mystically called the East, where the abominations of Babylon are unknown, and where the magnetic chain between earth and heaven is strong, that the man who seeks power, and who would achieve the great work, must accomplish his initiation. In assigning to the Gospels their proper meaning, it is necessary to remember that, as mystical scriptures, they deal primarily not with material things or persons, but with spiritual significations. Like the books of Moses, therefore, and others which, in being mystical, are, in the strictest sense, prophetical, the Gospels are addressed not to the outer sense and reason, but to the soul. And being thus, their object is not to give an historical account of the physical life of any man whatever, but to exhibit the spiritual possibilities of humanity at large, as illustrated in a particular and typical example. The design is, thus, that which is dictated by the nature itself of religion. For religion is not in its nature historical and dependent upon actual sensible events, but consists in processes, such as faith and redemption, which, being interior to all men, subsist irrespectively of what any particular man has at any time suffered or done. That alone which is of importance is what God has revealed, and therefore it is that the narratives concerning Jesus are rather parables founded on a collection of histories than any one actual history, and have a spiritual import capable of universal application. And it is with this spiritual import, and not with physical facts, that the Gospels are concerned. Such were the principles which, long before the Christian era, and under divine control, had led the mystics of Egypt, Persia, and India to select Osiris, Mithras, and Buddha as names or persons representative of the man regenerate, and constituting a full manifestation of the qualities of spirit. And it was for the same purpose and under the same impulsion that the mystics of the West, who had their headquarters at Alexandria, selected Jesus, using him as a type whereby to exhibit the history of all souls which attain to perfection. Employing physical occurrences as symbols, and relating them as parables, to interpret which literally would be to falsify their intended import. Their method was thus to universalize that which was particular and to spiritualize that which was material. And writing as they did, 
with full knowledge of previous mystical descriptions of the man regenerate, his interior history and his relations to the world, notable among which descriptions was the 53rd chapter of the miscellaneous fragmentary prophetic utterances collected together under the typical name of Isaiah. They would have had no difficulty in presenting a character consistent with the general anticipation of those who were cognizant of the meaning of the term Christ, even without an actual example. The failure to interpret the mystical scriptures by the mystical rule was due to the loss by the church of the mystical faculty or inner spiritual vision through which they were written. Passing under a domination exclusively sacerdotal and traditional and losing thereby the intuition of things spiritual, the church fell an easy prey to that which is the besettling sin of priesthoods, idolatry. And in place of the simple, true, reasonable gospel, to illustrate which the history of Jesus had been expressly designed, fabricated the stupendous and irrational superstition which has usurped his name. Converted by the exaltation of the letter and the symbol in place of the spirit and the signification into an idolatry every whit as gross as any that preceded it, Christianity has failed to redeem the world. Christianity has failed, that is, not because it was false, but because it had been falsified. And the falsification generally has consisted in removing the character described, under the name of Jesus, from its true function as the portrait of that of which every man has in him the potentiality, and referring it exclusively to an imaginary order of being, between whom and man could be no possible relation. Even were such a being himself possible, instead of recognizing the Gospels as a written hieroglyph, setting forth under terms derived from natural objects and persons, processes which are purely spiritual and impersonal, the churches have, one and all, fallen into that lowest mode of fetish worship, which consists in the adoration of a mere symbol, entirely irrespective of its true import. To the complaint that will inevitably be made against this exposition of the real nature of the gospel history, that it has taken away the Lord, the reply is no less satisfactory than obvious. For he has been taken away only from the place wherein, so long the church has kept him, that is, the sepulchre. There indeed it is, with the dead, bound about with cerements, a figure altogether of the past, that Christians have laid their Christ. But at length the, quote, stone of superstition has been lifted and rolled away by the hand of the angel of knowledge, and the grave it concealed is discovered to be empty. No longer need the soul seek her living master among the dead. Christ is risen, risen into the heaven of a living ideal, whence he can again descend into the hearts of all who desire him. None the less real and puissant, because a universal principle, and not merely an historical personage, none the less mighty to save because, instead of being a single man regenerate, he is every man regenerate, ten thousand times ten thousand, the Son of Man himself. The name of Jesus, or Liberator, belongs not to the man physical. Of his name and parentage the Gospels take no note but to the man spiritual, and is an initiation name denoting rebirth into a spiritual life. In this relation the man physical has no title to the name of liberator, since the limitations from which man requires to be delivered can be overcome only by that which transcends the physical. Wherefore the name Jesus belongs to that in and by which liberation occurs, namely the man's own regenerated selfhood, and whereas it is in and by means of this selfhood that he has emerged from a condition of spiritual death to one of spiritual life. It signifies to him a resurrection from the dead. 
Jesus is thus the name, not of one, but of many, not of a person, but of an order, the order of regenerated selfhoods, each of which is Christ Jesus, and that it is the Savior, through Christ, of him in whom it is realized. Though not all of these are Christ in the sense of being manifestations of Christ to the world. Paul alone of the apostles clearly taught the doctrine of the subjective nature of the saving agency. His expression, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is inapplicable to any physical or extraneous personality. As a Kabbalist and a mystic, Paul was an evolutionist and knew that the seed of every man's regeneration is within. Hence his exaltation of Christ as an interior principle and his ability to recognize that method of the mystical scriptures, which consists in regarding man as a distinct personality in each successive stage of his unfoldment and assigning to him a corresponding name. Adam, David, Jesus are thus respectively the man natural, being simply generate, the man under grace or partially regenerate, and therefore liable to serious lapses, and the man fully regenerate and incapable of sin. Hence Paul's declaration that in the Adam stage of our development we all die, not having yet realized our saving principle, but in the Christ stage we all have eternal life. It was not, however, so much Paul's mysticism as the sacerdotal guise in which he presented it that brought him into conflict with the disciples. Although the Gospels uniformly describe the miracles wrought by the man regenerate in terms derived from the physical plane, he as master of the spirits of all the elements works miracles on all planes. Only those, however, which are referable to the spiritual plane have significance and value for the soul. Henceforth, the raising from the dead, as of Lazarus, implies resurrection from the condition of spiritual deadness. The giving of sight implies the opening of the spiritual vision, and the feeding of the hungry multitude implies the satisfaction of man's craving for spiritual nourishment. The terms descriptive of the miracle last named afford one of the numerous indications of the influence of Greek ideas in the composition of the Gospels. For the loaves represent the doctrine of the lesser mysteries, whose grain is of the earth, the kingdom of Demeter and of the outer, and the fishes which are given after the loaves imply the greater mysteries, those of Aphrodite, fishes symbolizing the element of the sea-born queen of love, whose dominion is the inner kingdom of the soul. Similarly, the conversion of water into wine implies the mysteries of Iacos, the mystic name of the planet God. The beginning of miracles for the man regenerate is always the transmutation of the water of his own soul into the wine of the divine spirit. To these mysteries, which also were Egyptian, and there is reason to believe were enacted in the king and queen's chambers of the great pyramid, belong also the acts or crowns which constitute for the man regenerate the week of his new creation, each being a day in that week. They are baptism, called also betrothal in view of the subsequent marriage, temptation or trial, passion, crucifixion or death, burial, resurrection and ascension, the Sabbath, or nirvana of perfection and rest, when the veil of the temple, of the external selfhood having already been rent from the top to the bottom, he enters into the holy of holies of his now divine nature. All these acts or crowns, irrespective of any correspondence on the physical plane, denote indispensable processes enacted in the interior experiences of all who attain to full regeneration from which it follows that the gospel narrative, while related in scripture fashion, 
as of an actual particular person, and in terms derived from the physical plane, is a mystical history only of any person, and implies the spiritual possibilities of all persons. And hence, while using terms implying or derived from actual times, places, persons, and events, it does not really refer to these or make pretense to historical precision. Its function and purpose being not to relate physical facts, which can have no relation to the soul, but to exhibit and illustrate processes and principles which are purely spiritual. Thus regarded, the Gospels, even though having in view a special personality as their model, constitute a parable rather than a history. There is, moreover, a yet further explanation of the indifference to identity of detail by which everywhere this narrative is characterized. Being four in number, and disposed in order corresponding to that of the four divisions of man's nature, the Gospels have for standpoint, and bear relation to, different planes of the cosmos. Thus the Gospel of Matthew, which represents the lower and physical plane, appeals more particularly on behalf of the character ascribed to Jesus of Nazareth as fulfilling the promise of the Messiah of the Old Testament, and is pervaded by one principle, the fulfillment in him at once of the law and of the prophecies. The Gospel of Mark is adopted to the plane next above this, namely the rational, its appeal on behalf of the divinity of the mission of Jesus, being founded on the nature of his doctrine and works. The Gospel of Luke represents the further ascent to the plane of the soul and the intuition. Hence it occupies itself chiefly with accounts of the spiritual parentage of the man regenerate, setting forth under a parabolic narrative his genesis from the operation of God in a pure soul. To the same end, this gospel gives prominence to the familiar conversations rather than to the formal teachings of its subject, since it is in these that the affectional nature of a man is best manifested. In the fourth gospel, the scene changes to a sphere transcending all the others, being in the highest degree interior, mystic, spiritual. This gospel, therefore, corresponds to the nucleolus, or divine spirit, of the microcosmic entity, and exhibits the regenerate man as having surmounted all the elements exterior and inferior of his system, and won his way to the inmost recesses of his own celestial kingdom, where, arrived at his center and source, he and his Father are one. And he knows positively that God is love, since it is by love that he himself has found and become God. Such being the controlling idea of this gospel, its composition is appropriately assigned to that beloved disciple, whose very name denotes the feminine and love principle of existence, and to John, surnamed the Divine, in respect of the character thus ascribed to his ministry, is unanimously assigned the emblem of the eagle as representing the highest element in the human kingdom. With regard to the distribution of the other three symbols, it is obvious when once the intention of each division of the Christian evangel is understood, that Matthew, who corresponds to the earth or body, is rightly represented by the ox, Mark, the minister of the astral or fire, by the lion, and Luke, whose pen is chiefly occupied with the relation of Christ to the soul, by an angel with the face of a man, to denote the sea-god Poseidon, the father of souls. The Gospels are thus dedicated, each to one of the elemental spirits, Demeter, Hephaestos, Poseidon, and Pallas. Owing, however, to the loss by the Church of the doctrine which determines this distribution, much confusion and difference of opinion exist among ecclesiastical authorities, with regard to the correct assignment of the elemental emblems. All the fathers are agreed in giving the eagle to the fourth gospeler, 
and but little doubt exists respecting the claim of Mark to the lion. But the ox and angel have been generally misplaced in order 